Uh, good morning, everyone, and um, a very big thank you to our audience for joining us this morning. Um, my name is Diane DeVaco, and I'm the research administrator at uh, the Centre of Excellence for Mathematical and Statistical Sciences, um, and we are hosting this information session this morning. Our, um, I'd like to just introduce our speaker uh, for this morning's seminar. Um, and that is Ms. Kaz McNamara. Um, just to give you a little bit of information about Kaz, she is currently the manager of the DSI NRF Center of Excellence in Mathematical and Statistical Sciences and is previously the manager of the National DSI NICIS National eScience Training, uh, Teaching and Training Platform. Um, and these are both multi university collaborative projects. Um, she's also managed the development of the multidisciplinary Sydney Brenner Institute in Molecular Biosciences and has served on numerous conference local organization committees, local organizing committees. Uh, today she's joining us to present an information session entitled um, Applying for 2021 Postgrad Funding Using the New NRF Postgraduate One Call System. Uh, just before I ask Cass to start, just to note that um, as it says in the slide that you can currently see, please type any questions into for the Q&A session into the chat box for after the presentation. Um, please write your questions out in full and also include your name and institution in your uh, username so that we can see who you are. Um, but I'll hand you over now to Kaz. Um, I think that's all the housekeeping for now. Um, so Kaz. Great. Thank you very much for the introduction, Diane. I trust you can hear me okay. Perfect. No problems. Fantastic. Uh, welcome, everyone, to today's session. Um, I'd like to kick off just by reminding everyone that uh, this session is uh, really an info sharing session. So it's to give you more information to be able to go ahead and complete your NRF bursary application on the NRF online system. Uh, but this talk is really being presented um, as a collective initiative by some of the Centres of Excellence, um, including the Centres of Excellence in Paleo Sciences and Strong Materials. Um, we really thought this was a critical um, engagement to have because we know that a lot of you do have lots of questions about how the system works and how it's different to the previous iteration of the NRF applications. So I hope that by the end of the presentation, uh, a lot of the information and the questions you might have might already be clear. Um, so if you're not sure, maybe hold your question, maybe just type your question and keep it to yourself for now and share it at the end, um, because maybe it might come up as we go. Um, but if you can, if I can also just ask that you please do keep your microphone on mute for the duration of the just the presentation section. Um, and then at the end, we can take questions um, mostly via the text, but if there's somebody who has a burning question that they can't convey via text that they would like to say, then we'll ask people on a one-on-one -on -one basis to unmute and just ask that question and mute again, just so that we don't get lots of feedback into the venue, because there are quite a lot of people connected. Um, and just one other thing before we kick off, at the bottom of the screen, you'll see that these slides will be available for you to download. So if you miss anything, you can always just download it later. They will be available on the COE Mass Bursaries page, um, which is if you click on funding and then bursaries, um, by a close of business today. And we will also make a recording of this presentation available. Um, on for uh, on our YouTube channel. So if you just Google COE Mass YouTube, you will find our YouTube channel where you can download a video of this. Okay. Um, so without further ado, uh, let's kick off. And if we do have any questions, um, we will actually be um, having another info sharing session specifically for questions only there won't be a presentation but in the same time slot next week friday we will be available online to answer any questions that you might have if you have done for example part of your application and have gotten stuck in the process so we, we will also be available next week for that okay right so 
Um, how, uh, just to flag again, this is not an official NRF presentation. It's something that the CREs have put together, but we've got a series of screenshots that we will hope that uh, will help you in your application going forward. But first of all, before we even get to that point of actually getting into the system, I would like to remind students who are currently funded in this year, 2021, and are continuing with the same degree into next year, 20, uh, sorry, 2020 into 2021. You do not need to do a new application for continuated, uh, continuated funding of your same degree in next year. So if you are doing master's first year this year and will be continuing with a master's in your second year next year, you do not need to apply this year under the one call system. Um, so uh, if, if you were concerned about that, please uh, be advised that you will receive an annual progress report from the NRF, probably via your center of excellence. We're, we're yet to have confirmation about that um, at this stage. Uh, but you will get an annual progress report to fill in for your continuate, uh, continuation into next year. We wanted to flag three helpful documents that we think that you should read through, please, before you complete your application online. Uh, these, this information gives you a lot of um, helpful hints um, and also a lot of the information about eligibility criteria. Uh, so that will be really helpful for you to go through all of these links. Um, you, if you haven't accessed them already via the NRF webpage, uh, if you download this presentation uh, at the end of close of business today, you'll just be able to click on the hyperlinks to take you to that documentation. Um, we've also uploaded a series of helpful PowerPoint slides on the bursaries page of our website. Um, they are shown here uh, at the bottom. Uh, if you scroll down the bursaries page, you'll be able to click and download those. So that includes one of the key NRF documents, uh, a joint presentation that some CREs put together, and we've also just uploaded the VITS uh, bursary inf information here. Uh, but obviously, you should look at your specific institution's um, information as well. So there's lots of resources available. Please don't feel like there aren't things out there to be able to assist you. This presentation will also be uploaded on the same page today. So just to flag in terms of who is eligible to apply for bursaries, um, these eligibility criteria are defined by the NRF. They aren't decided upon by your center of excellence. So unfortunately, we have no control over these. If you sit outside of these eligibility criteria, then you won't be able to apply. Um, and we unfortunately can't make exceptions. You know, we, we can't adjust these rules from our side because they are set by the NRF who provides the funding. Um, the specific bursary RAND value breakdowns and also the maximum award times for each degree level can be found um, in the slides that will be on, the, uh, on our web page. Um, so if you're looking for very specific detail, uh, you can find that there. Um, in terms of internal deadlines, uh, each university, depending on where you're wanting to apply for your bursary next year, so let's say next year you want to do a PhD at the University of the Western Cape, you would need to look at that university's internal deadline and you would need to make sure that your application is submitted by their internal deadline. Unfortunately, with the new system, there's only one time of year at which you can apply for these NRF bursaries going forward. So if you miss this deadline, what it means is even if you submit late, you will actually go into the funding cycle for the following year's uh, application, which means you would only effectively be applying for funding in 2022. So please, if I can just impress on you the importance of getting your application in on time, according to the internal deadline that your university of interest has uh, indicated, that is really important in terms of this process. And the NRF at the end of the day has the final say with regard to all the bursary selection processes and the awards that they make, because this is their funding from the South African taxpayers, um, and they have the final say as to how that is administered. So in terms of what we're going to go through in this talk, uh, we are really looking at masters and doctoral and honors first time applications. So you're starting a new degree next year in 2021. 
Um, and really, the process we will be looking at is exactly this area that's outlined in this orange block. Uh, there are many processes that will happen later um, as part of the selection process and the financial needs assessment process. But really, for your purposes, the application uh, is really just this orange section of this timeline. Um, in terms of masters and doctoral first time applicants, applications will be accepted from South African citizens and South African permanent residents, as well as international applications. However, if we look then at uh, first time honours applications, I'd like to flag for everybody's interest that unfortunately applications will not be accepted by the NRF for international students at the honours level. So for honours, it will really only be South African citizens and South African permanent residents that can apply through that process. Um, what we do recommend is if you do know of friends in your department who are not South African permanent residents, but are in fact eligible to apply to become permanent residents, and they want to stay in South Africa, we would encourage you to encourage them to go and apply to Department of Home Affairs for permanent residency status if they're eligible, because this certainly stands them in good stead for being able to attain additional funding in the future. Um, so really, in terms of the NRF online process, um, we will be going through the NRF submission portal on their website. Uh, for COEs, you will be applying under the general scholarship category. And we will be including the UID or the unique identifier for the COE as part of your application in a way of indicating that you would like to belong to a certain center of excellence or that you are applying to a certain center of excellence for consideration for funding. If you do go ahead and apply to a center for funding and you are unsuccessful in getting funding from that particular center of interest, you are still then eligible to get funding under the general pool of applications. So you might not get COE funding, but you might still be able to get other NRF funding. So please don't worry if you're uncertain, um, rather try and apply. And if you're unsuccessful in the one category of COEs, you will automatically be shifted into the general pool and will have an additional chance at applying there. Um, the reason I say this is because, as you may know, uh, Centre of Excellence bursaries are very competitive. So going forward, the NRF have um, put together some criteria in terms of eligibility through a series of engagements um, that they have done with various stakeholders across the South African sector. Um, and one of the things that they have implemented as part of the new one call process is that there is a maximum age that you can be at for, uh, in terms of application and a maximum age that you need to be at by completion of the degree. Now, unfortunately for people who are already older than these age limits, um, this is very problematic uh, because obviously you can't then apply to the NRF for this particular type of funding. Um, however, we would like to remind everyone that the NRF is by no means the only source of funding in South Africa. It just happens to be the one that a lot of universities talk about a lot, so it's one you know about. But if you are, for example, older than these maximum age limits and you would like to apply to do a master's or a PhD, you most certainly can do that, but you would need to source an alternative source of funding um, other than NRF funding in order to be able to take part um, if you want a funded um, study period. Um, in terms of targets for bursary allocation, um, obviously these are in terms of the country's transformation agenda. Uh, there is an allocation for South African citizens and permanent residents. And then you'll see that only 5% of bursaries are um, covered for SADC and the rest of the world. That's really because the nature of South African funding is that, that it's derived uh, by the DSI from National Treasury in terms of the South African taxpayers. And the thinking behind this is that South African taxpayers are paying for South Africans to be developed within the country um, rather than to fund external people where they should, the thinking is that they should be getting funding from their particular country of residence. Um, there is also a criteria in terms of 55% of applicants should be female um, in terms of uh, gender equity. 
Uh, they are also targets for um, uh, uh, disaggregated race groups, and also 1% of the awards will be made to persons with disabilities. Again, uh, these criteria are set by the NRF, um, so the centres of excellence are not in a position to um, amend these. In terms of the NRF postgraduate pipeline, what this means is once you go through the process of applying, um, you will get one of two award amounts allocated to you. Either, depending on your financial need status, you will be given what is called FCS or full cost of study. And if you are in the other category, you will receive PCS, which is partial cost of study funding. This slide just outlines the criteria that are needed in order to get either full cost or partial cost of study. I'm not going to go through them in detail, but really this is determined by academic merit and by financial need status and disability status and nationality status. So depending on your, your marks, your nationality um, and that kind of thing, you will be allocated into one of these categories. Um, obviously, I'm sure everyone would like the full cost of study option. Um, but in terms of the budget, that's not always possible in terms of what government is trying to fund. And you will be allocated either FCS or PCS based on your status. So starting off, if we get to the point now that um, you're going to be doing your NRF online application, um, the first thing you will need to do is create for yourself an individual NRF profile if you don't already have one. If you do, that's great. You've already got one created. You can just proceed to starting with the application. Uh, if you have not, you will go to the landing page uh, to the NRF submission system, and you will go to this little link at the bottom that says not registered. Click here to register. And that will take you through the process of creating your own individual NRF profile, which you will then use in all of your dealings with the NRF going forward. So the link is given at the top of the page on how to get to this landing page. And once you've created your profile, you will then go to the login section and you will log in with your ID or passport number if you're a foreign national and your password that you've set up when you created your profile. Okay. Um, in the event that you do forget your password, you are able to reset it with this link at the bottom. So, uh, once you have logged in, uh, you will see that uh, you get to a page that looks something like this. And on the side, on the top left, you will see that there is a black block that you can then click on My Applications. And then you will get an option uh, to select Create Application. So, you will go to this section. And then once that has been done, uh, it will ask what application to the NRF you are trying to create. So you will then go and select NRF Postgraduate Scholarship and you will click on this little button over here on the right hand side. And that will then create for you an application for your postgrad bursary that you're interested in. The very first thing that will happen is you'll get a pop up screen that will look something like this. And it will ask you to please confirm all of your information. Now, I've obviously blocked it out for confidentiality purposes, but you will be asked to double check that your phone number, your email address, etc., are all correct. And what we would like to advise you is please, when you set up your profile, make sure that you use an email address that will last for your lifetime. So we would recommend that you rather use a Gmail or a Yahoo account or something like that rather than your university email address because your university email address would normally become inactive as soon as you finish your current degree. So you finish your honours degree and you leave that institution to take up a master's at another university and the NRF is still trying to then connect to you via your old email address which is now invalid. So please do check this um, and make sure that you are using contact details, including a phone number, for example, 
um, that will last beyond the time frame at your current uh, degree or institution. So once you've confirmed that all your contact details are correct, uh, you will then be generated a specific identifying number for your given application. You will see this application number appear at the top of your application. Um, I've obviously just <coughs> blocked some of it out. Um, and then underneath it, you will see a series of instructions. Throughout the NRF online system, you will see instructions given at the beginning of each section. And we encourage you to read those instructions if things are unclear, because they often give you the answers to how you fill in the section below. Um, so please check those first before you email your Center of Excellence or the NRF to say that you're stuck on something, because quite often the information is included in the instruction section that's given. Okay. So your application has now been created on the system. And you will see that right at the top, you will get a list, um, a, a, a link, sorry, to uh, the NRF call documentation that's relevant for your particular bursary you've applied for. So by clicking here, you can actually then read the documentation, um, the NRF documentation that's relevant to your application. And what you'll need to do throughout the process is you'll see that there's a little checklist. There's a series of sections that are given to you that you need to fill in. And it will show you uh, with this little complete status box um, if there's still something outstanding that you need to include. So, and as soon as the section is fully complete, it will change from a little cross to a little green tick. And then you'll know that that section is fully completed and you can move on to the next section. You can save this application in stages. So if you've only done half of one section and you don't have time to finish it, you can save and come back to it later. Only once all of these status bars have become green ticks, will the final submit button change from a grayed out button to an actual button that you can click on. So if there's anything in your application process that you haven't yet finished, you will not be able to submit your application. Okay, there's also a very helpful little print preview button at the bottom here. You can go to the print preview section and you can save your application in its current stage. Um, and this is often quite helpful, for example, if you want to send it, for example, to your supervisor to have a look at. Um, so you could save it as a PDF and then potentially email it to them to check and to confirm or to see if there's something you need to add in. So that is quite a helpful little tool to use. So in beginning with your application, the first few sections that you saw on the previous page are all linked to your profile. So things like your last higher degree, et cetera. And once you've completed all of those, the next set of sections that you will work on are really the sections that are related specifically to your research project. So in going forward, um, the main ones that we think uh, are maybe problematic or that you're confused about, um, we, we've highlighted some of those and we're going to take you through some of those just to flag some key uh, things to look at. In terms of the ORCID profile, you will see that you have to create an ORCID profile for yourself. We've given you the link here to be able to do that. It's also in the instructions here if you are uncertain. And you need to link your ORCID ID number to your NRF profile. One, the next section uh, that we think is problematic is you may not know which one to choose from these options. Under the application category section, you should choose general scholarship if you're applying to a COE. Um, and then the, once you've selected that, it will then ask you what your proposed institution is where you will study in 2021. So please, under that, um, some of the questions only appear once you've filled in the preceding question. So you'll only see that question once you've selected general scholarship. Um, and you should please indicate where you want to study next year, not where you are this year. So if you're at um, UNISA this year, but next year you want to start your PhD at the University of Free State, please indicate that your institution is Free State for 2021. 
the next section that appears is the section related to financial need. Uh, this is really in terms of um, a similar example would be the undergraduate uh, students who are on NISFAS bursaries. So those are students who have a household financial income of less than or equal to 350,000 Rand per year. You will know which category you do apply in. However, if you are an international student, no matter what amount of money your, uh, your family as a collective earns, you'll see the green highlighting indicates international students must select the green option. And that is because international students are only eligible for partial cost of study, as you would have seen in the previous slides. So please keep this in mind. Even if you are an international student with a household income of less than 350,000, you will still need to indicate more than 350,000 on this application form. Okay. Um, in terms of financial need, as I mentioned previously, some of the questions on the form will only appear based on your previous answer. So when you indicate that your household income might be less than or equal to 350,000, you will then see a series of follow-up questions. These are related to the financial means test that will need to be done by the NRF. Um, and uh, you can indicate here whether one has already been done for you uh, maybe you're a NISFAS student and you've recently had one done for that process. Um, and if you haven't had one done, then you need to fill out the consent form to have one done for you. So you would download this consent form, the blank one here, the template, fill it in, sign it and upload it here so that your financial means test can be conducted. Uh, there's a, a very um, strong recommendation that you complete the, the section entitled Details of Research in very close consultation with your proposed 2021 research supervisor. Uh, these applications are very competitive and it's really important that the project section of what you're intending on working on is um, very comprehensive. So we ask you to be mindful of the fact to include your milestones and your timelines of your aims and objectives um, as part of that process. And there are also two questions as part of the section, potential impact of your research and alignment to national imperatives. It's very easy to think, oh, these aren't important and try and sort of leave them out or fill in the bare minimum. But governments are placing more and more emphasis on these areas because they are wanting to fund programs that are aligned to areas of national importance and that have impact on society. So please, we do encourage you to work closely with your supervisor to think through what is the potential impact of the research. And even if you're in a very fundamental um, research area, like pure mathematics, for example, there are ways that you can build impact and alignment to national imperatives into your project. So please, if you're stuck with those, please, please, please consult your research supervisor and or your center of excellence to have a discussion about ways in which your project may align to those particular areas of interest. Um, there is also a section on science communication. Uh, this is very important. You'll see again that I've used the example of the field of pure mathematics. Um, very much uh, in having been uh, in competing against many other people for these applications, it's important that for research as a whole, you see the bigger picture for your research and how it fits into the world. We have also included here a link to the science engagement framework. Um, yes, it is the DSI now, but when this engagement framework came out, the document was called the DST Science Engagement Framework, um, and it outlines the national science communication policy. So if you're unsure about science communication and how you're communicating your science and whether it's correct for what the national imperatives are, please have a look at this um, and just try and pick out some key areas where your research can fit in with science communication. Again, speak to your supervisor if you get stuck with regard to this. 
they will be able to assist you. Uh, then in terms of uh, the references section of your application, uh, you will see that you need to provide references as part of this process. So this is a supervisor reference. In the instructions, again, if you read through the instructions section, you will see that it indicates if you are to belong to a COE, if you are interested in applying to a COE to fund you, you need to indicate the um, NRF UID grant number, the unique identification number for the COE grant so that the NRF are able to link the fact that you are trying to apply to a particular centre. Now, how you go about doing that is under the references section, when you click add, to add in the name of your supervisor, you will get a screen like this to fill in with the information about your supervisor. So you will fill in your supervisor's information here, and you will see that there's a section that says supervisor's UID grant number. And in here, you will fill in the COE UID for your particular center of interest. Okay, so if you're applying to the COE mass, you'll fill in the COE masses number 91486. If you're applying to the center of excellence for paleo sciences, make sure you fill in their unique number. Um, the unique numbers are listed here for a series of the centers within the country. Um, however, there are many more centers than are listed here. So if you are interested in applying to a center who is not listed on this list, we encourage you to get in touch with that center, um, check on their website and make contact with them and ask them for their UID number. At this stage, I do need to flag um, that at the moment we have already identified a problem on the system um, whereby the system is currently not accepting numbers at this point. Um, we have flagged this with the NRF. They are aware of the technical issue and they are currently working on this problem. So what we ask you to do is to just, you can complete the rest of your application in the interim to get everything ready for your application, but don't fill in the grant number just yet. As soon as we are aware that the grant numbers are live, uh, we will try and inform as many of you as possible through our Center of Excellence websites and our various newsletters so that you can then actually uh, put this in and it, for it to be accepted by the system. So we are aware of this technical glitch at the moment um, and the NRF are aware of this and they are working on the problem on the system side. So please don't panic. If you put in a number and click accept, and you get an error message to say the UID is not valid. Um, the, the numbers themselves are valid. It's just that the, the system is not currently accepting them due to a technical error. Um, we hope this will be resolved shortly. So please keep staying in touch with your center of excellence to find out uh, if the glitch has been resolved, because we'll, we'll know about it when it has. Um, and then as soon as that's done, you will be able to do your final, uh, to complete that section and to do your final submission. Um, as I mentioned earlier, in terms of previewing, uh, you can use the print preview option to generate a PDF version of your application in case you want to circulate it to anyone to comment on. Um, and you can also save your application if you're midway through it um, and you want to come back to it later you can save it, and when you do come back to it later, instead of creating an application, which you would have already done, you would just go to your list of applications, and you would see your pending application listed. And you can just go to the edit button to continue working on it. Uh, in terms of the submission, when you get to the point when your whole application is complete to do your final submit, it's highly recommended as with all documentation, that you keep a personal copy for yourself and also just send one to your supervisor. It's always good to do that so that they're aware of what you submitted in the end. Um, and you can obviously do that through saving through the print preview function. Um, and then uh, please don't forget, once you have submitted your application to the NRF, please email your application reference number the one that was at the top of your application that we looked at a few slides back, and send this through to your preferred COE that you've applied to, 
because the center will like to, would like to track your applications with the NRF. And if we don't have your application reference number, we aren't able to do that and see how your application is progressing. So please uh, don't forget to email your Center of Excellence. Uh, their email addresses were also shown on the previous slide um, so that we have a copy of your application reference number available uh, so that we are able to um, keep track of those applications once they're in. Um, from my side, that's really a quick walkthrough um, with regard to the uh, application process. Um, and hopefully that has helped already answer a few of your questions that you might have that might be pending. Um, I'm glad that we got through that in about half an hour because that was what I was really aiming for because I'd like to open the session now for um, questions from the floor. Um, so I know that some questions I think have been coming through. If you've got a question that you would like to submit that we maybe haven't answered, um, please do send it through in the chat now. Um, Diane and Seham are both keeping a list of those questions for us, um, and we'll begin by going through those questions. Um, I can't guarantee that we will be able to answer every single question, um, but we will do our best to answer what we can, um, and then we can also take additional questions to the NRF uh, for further clarification. Although you are also reminded that you are also in a position to contact uh, the contact person for the NRF who is listed in the NRF call documents. There is an indicated person uh, who is available for COE uh, masters and COE doctoral questions. Uh, so you may email her uh, as per the information given in the call documentation if you have additional queries that your center of excellence is not able to assist you with. So we'll try our very best to help as much as we can um, but please do understand that we might not have every single answer available. Um, so with that, I'd like to open for questions. Um, Diane, um, would you like to um, perhaps uh, flag some key questions that have come through? Um, hi, um, Kaz, hi. thank you. Yeah, I just want to just start by thanking you on behalf of myself and the centre and the audience um, for, your, for your information session. Um, which I have no doubt was absolutely um, vital for a lot of people. Uh, I first typed question through from Esmeri uh, Marie from Stellenbosch University. Um, yes. I'm just going to read these verbatim, if that's okay. Um, Perfect. In the person history section, we have to specify yes. funding for previous slash current studies. If we have been or are funded by COE Mass, which one should we choose? Does it count as an NRF funded bursary? So yes, COE bursaries, if there isn't a specific option that says COE, then you should select the option that says NRF because as you are aware, the COEs are funded directly by the National Department of Science and Innovation through the NRF. So yes, COE bursaries are NRF bursaries. Okay, excellent. Thanks. Uh, the next question that's come through is from Nasira from UCT. Um, she says, thank you for this helpful session. I'm applying for funding for my PhD. For my MSc, I did not get a mark, but rather a pass or fail. Do I submit my mark from my honours degree instead? What should I do? Um, I think the important thing there, sorry, and I can't see the screen that the students would be looking at. Um, I think the important thing there is to check with your university research office as to what they are currently proposing. So again, please remember that each application is submitted to your institution where you will study in 2021. And the university may have a specific stance that they are taking um, about what to do in the instance where there isn't a set mark allocated for your masters. Um, Certainly, you wouldn't want to submit the honours mark and then they disregard your application um, because you haven't actually completed the requirement of putting in a master's mark. So please check with your um, NRF designated authority. Um, this is a person at probably your university research office um, who is appointed by the NRF to assist with NRF related questions. Um, and that NRF DA will be able to assist you with what your specific institution is doing. Because once you click that final submit button, 
your application sits at your university with the NRFDA to check for eligibility to make sure that you filled in the applications correctly before they're actually passed on to the NRF for assessment. So um, please do be in touch with your university. Um, I don't want to tell you what one university is doing because if another university is doing something different, um, that could create a lot of confusion in the process. So please check with your research office. I'm sorry I can't give you something more specific than that, but they would be in the best position to advise you on that. Um, if in doubt, please also check with your supervisor um, if you aren't sure who the person is in the research office who is able to assist you, because your research supervisors at your various institutions will know who the right person is to be able to assist you from your institution's research office. I hope that that helps point you in the right direction, even though it's not a full answer. Okay, thanks, Kaz, and thanks, Nasira, for the question. I've got a question here. There's no name or institution. Um, what is the internal closing dates for NRF at FITS? So, uh, folks, all of those dates, I don't have them on hand because this certainly our CRE works with 18 universities. Um, you are directed, please, um, to have a look at the documentation that we have submitted and loaded for you already on our website. Um, certainly, we have about 12 universities that submitted their internal dates to us. However, we know that some of them have changed. So, um, as you have seen, uh, please consult your university directly for deadlines, because as the centre, we can't take responsibility for a deadline, and then your university might change it, and we aren't informed about it, and then you say, but the Centre of Excellence told us date X. So please do check some of those. If you look at the presentations that are loaded on the bursaries page of our website, you will see that there's a provisional page of internal deadlines there. And we encourage you to contact the university of choice to check when their final deadline is. Okay, thanks, Kez. The next question, I've only got a username, uh, Henok Tenor. Um, the question is, I have received my MSc thesis result last month, but I don't have a certificate yet. How can I include it under qualification, as it seems like I can't select completed since I don't have the transcript? Um, so if you have a formal letter from your university registrar with your results, um, you might be able to upload that as an alternative. Um, again, please check with your university of interest. Uh, your 2021 university um, with the designated authority, the NRFDA at your institution, uh, just to confirm that before you do attach it. Um, you can also check with your research supervisor, but normally a registrar's letter that says that your master's degree has been completed um, would be sufficient, even if you haven't walked across the stage yet, or with COVID maybe sitting at home, have maybe electronically graduated, um, even if you don't have the actual certificate, um, usually a letter on a letterhead from the faculty registrar would serve as an interim document that would be acceptable to confirm that you have, in fact, completed that master's degree. Okay, thanks, Kaz. Um, again, I just want to encourage everyone who's writing questions to please include your name and your institution, because um, I have another question here, but there's no name. Um, the institution is WITS, though. I'm a recent Master of Science Research graduate, uh, so this year in March, um, in computer science from WITS. Equally, I'm an international student. My question is, do I stand a chance of being funded in a thesis-based PhD degree? So um, I'm not sure what you mean by simultaneously you're an international student. I'm assuming what you mean is you're you're an international citizen, so not a citizen of South Africa. Um, if that is the case, um, as you saw, 5% of awards will go to people from beyond South Africa. So I, I, can't, I can't tell you if you will be successful in a process like that. Um, obviously, it depends on the number of applications that come in and the various criteria that are fulfilled um, as part of the application process. Um, but certainly, provided you meet all the eligibility criteria, you are not exempt from applying. However, one thing I can guarantee you is that if you don't apply, you definitely won't get money. Um, so if you are looking for funding, uh, certainly 
make the effort to apply, and then you may be in a successful position to receive funding. However, if you don't buy a lotto ticket, you can't win the lotto. So that would be my advice for that one. Okay, thanks, Kaz. Um, just a note here from Christine. Um, there was an earlier question about the closing date for VITS. Um, we've got a date for the 26th of June, just to let everyone from VITS know. Um, okay, our next question is from Simpiwe. Sorry, also... just, just to flag that again, um, the sure. reason I didn't give out that date is mm. there may be a situation because of the technical glitch on the NRF system, dates might change. So please aim towards that date, but please be advised that you need to stay in touch with your research office just to double check throughout the process because the dates may in fact change. Hopefully that means extended, um, but certainly for now the deadline is the 26th of June at WITS. I know, for example, that I think UJ happens to be earlier than that. So please, again, I don't want to give out exact dates. I want to make sure that you contact your university check on your university's relevant pages um, and, and find that information. Thanks. Okay, thanks, Kaz. Um, our next question is from Simpiwe from WITS, um, and they ask, can I apply if I'm planning to complete my MSc later in the year? Later in which year? Um, Simpiwe, if you are listening, could you unmute your mic and just clarify when you are completing? Do you mean you're completing your master's later this year? Or do you mean you're going to be completing your master's later in 2021? No, later in, in this year. Yeah, then you can you can definitely apply. So, so for anybody who's wanting to start in 2021, you will be able to, to go ahead and apply this year. Does that, that make sense? Is that clear? Yes, that's clear. Thank you. Super, no problem. Okay, great. Thanks for that question. Got another um, Vitz question from Nola Tando, who says, am I eligible for funding if I'm working full time and then in brackets intern and would like to do my PhD full time? Um, so there is a requirement that you need to register for the degree full time. And we haven't seen the new contracts yet. But certainly in the old contracts, you weren't allowed to be working more than a certain amount of hours, um, which was a very small amount of hours, almost just enough to be able to allow people to do certain tutoring. Um, we do know that there will be a requirement in the new contracts going forward um, for people who are recipients of bursaries to have to do some work for their university. But we suspect that that will be almost um, in a sort of tutoring, you know, TA assistant kind of a position. If you have a, a sort of paying job, like an NRF internship, or, you know, something where you are getting a, a monthly salary, um, then it is unlikely. Then you can, you can certainly apply um, for the funding, um, but then you may have to actually give up the job in order to take the funding. So, so you can certainly apply and see if you're successful. And then if you find out that you're successful down the line, then you will have to make that decision um, based on your contract that you will sign for your bursary as to whether you want to reject the bursary and carry on working or um, maybe resign from the position and take up the PhD or whatever full time. Certainly going forward, these awards are only for full timers. They are no longer part-time funded NRF bursaries in this fashion. Okay, great. Thanks, Kaz. Um, at the moment, I've got um, a lot of thank yous from our audience, just to let you know, um, particularly for answering questions. Um, I don't have any more questions on the chat, so I just want to, again, invite um, people in the audience to please unmute their microphones to ask questions. Yeah, very happy to take questions uh, via via chat if you don't want to type them out in full. Um, and just to remind everyone that if you do start on your application this week and you do get stuck in the process, just a reminder that we will have a Q&A open session. There won't be any presentation, uh, but we will be online uh, for the hour next week between 10.30 and 11.30 uh, just to answer any questions that people may have. So you can 
feel free to join us again once you've done part of your application um, and then ask us questions if you're getting stuck uh, with the actual process. So that'll, that'll be next week, uh, the 12th of June. Okay, great. And also, um, I think at the moment, just um, to ask anyone who's actually started the process of applying, um, if they have found themselves getting stuck anywhere, it'd be really useful for other people um, if they've got any questions at the moment. Yeah. So please just unmute your microphone and ask a question. Is there anyone who has um, started the application already and, and had some major challenges that you'd like to share to help others? Um, certainly in terms of a Q&A session, those questions and answers and suggestions need not come from us. Um, so if you have had a particular obstacle that you had to um, resolve from maybe a technical uh, area um, in terms of your application that you've already started on, please do feel free to share that with others that are listening now. Um, hi guys, so do you, do you mind if I just ask a question? Yeah, sure, sure, just just introduce yourself. Introduce introduce yourself. Like. Right, right. my name is Armstrong, I'm a postdoc from VETS as well, but um, I was just invited to sit in this meeting. Um, I think, uh, well, thanks a lot for the info. Um, so I just wanted to ask concerning dates. Um, <clears throat> um, so I have, maybe perhaps I'm targeting specific um, um, funding for uh, postdocs. Uh, where do I really go for uh, to ask for information regarding cut-off dates, like internal cut-off dates? Uh, I'm not really aiming at a specific postdoctoral fund, but then just for postdocs, do you perhaps know? Um, so certainly uh, the point of call would be your university's research office. Um, in terms of if you are looking for specific uh, postdocs, you can also please uh, check with your head of school. Um, normally, because postdocs can be field specific, um, it's good to ask uh, some of the senior academics that are within your school. Um, you know, if you if you're working in I don't know molecular biology, you might want to I don't know get the Sydney Brenner postdoc for molecular biochemistry or something. Um, so certainly, if you ask the senior academics within your school, they will sort of know of what the the postdocs are. And in terms of university postdocs, those are normally um, advertised or, or dealt with by your university research office. Um, in the case of uh, Armstrong, you did say you were at WITS, is that correct? Correct, yes, thanks. Um, we have a staff member at WITS in the WITS University Research Office. His name is Mr. Alban Van Roy, and he is the postdoctoral officer who deals with all postdocs at WITS. Uh, so you'll be able to check with him. It's albin.vanroy at bits.ac.za. He will be able to give you more information. In addition, if you are interested in a Center of Excellence postdoctoral fellowship, um, those are also offered. And each Center of Excellence will have its own cutoff date. So you would need to identify what your COE of interest is. So maybe you're interested in a postdoc in, from the Center of Excellence in Strong Materials because you work in physics. So then you would approach that particular COE and you would engage them about their particular postdoc process. Hope that helps. Very helpful, thank you so much. Sure. Okay, great. Um, we've got another question from Nasira from UCT. Mm -hmm. um, and she asks, under person history for previous studies, are they referring to any study or is it a study towards a degree? I ask because I did my MSc and then a postgraduate study before applying for my PhD. Um, so normally those questions refer to specific uh, what we call NQF level degrees um, or diplomas. So, uh, for example, um, it, it might be a postdoctoral certificate in a particular field. field. Maybe you did a, sorry, I've got sorry. some feedback coming through, if you could just mute uh, microphones. Um, uh, and, and so it would be a, a series of your personal history, what other studies have you done? 
Um, some people, for example, do two different masters in different fields, like maybe a master's in mathematics and then a master's in data science, and then want to go on and do a PhD in computer science, for example. So personal history is really to give the people looking at the applications um, an indication of what your previous uh, fun, uh, what your previous uh, education qualifications are. So if you've done both a postdoctoral, I'm um, sorry, a post um, a post certificate or diploma and then a master's or a master's and a diploma, then feel free to fill in all of those. Does okay, that help thanks. Nasira? I hope that answer has helped. Um, if, if it hasn't helped, um, if, if you're unsure and you can only fill in one, I would recommend that you always fill in your highest previous qualification. So if you're applying for a PhD, that would be the master's level. Um, and if you're unsure, maybe you've got a certificate and a diploma and you're not sure which one is higher, um, with, with long-term degrees, each degree is pegged at what we call an NQF level a national qualifications framework level. So it would be whichever degree has the highest NQF level. So just to give you an indication, an honours degree is an eight, a master's degree is an NQF level nine, and a PhD is an NQF level 10. Um, so if you can't put it, if you can only put in one, go with whatever your highest previous NQF level qualification would be. Okay, Nasira says, got it, that helps. Thank you. Fantastic. <clears throat> Super. Well, um, considering that uh, we don't have any more questions coming through, could I then um, recommend to anyone who might have additional questions going forward that you please get in touch with your relevant centre of excellence for further assistance and or your university's research office via your university NRF designated authority or NRFDA, and they will be able to assist you with uh, the process going forward. Um, and please feel free to come back to us next week, Friday, the 12th of June, between 10.30 and 11.30, if you have any questions about the actual system um, or questions about the content that you're busy, busy writing that you're stuck on, um, and we will try and assist you through that process. We will be online for that hour. Um, You'll be able to just ask your, your questions um, directly via your microphone. So thank you very much for your attention for today. Excellent. Thanks so much, Kaz. And um, we've got a, quite a few thank yous in the chat. So Samta says, thank you for the helpful information. Um, just a reminder to everyone that this inf the slides are also available on our website. Um, from uh, If you check right now, they won't be there, but they should be available from 1 o'clock this afternoon. Um, so if you wanted to review those, please go to our funding page and click on the bursaries page. Um, and yeah, as Kaz said, we'll be available next week um, during the seminar session time to answer any further questions. Um, and the video recording will be available from Wednesday. Um, if you Google COE Mass YouTube, you'll find our YouTube channel and today's recording will be available there. So if you have colleagues who weren't able to attend today's session, please just direct them to the COE Mass YouTube channel and they can download this video if they'd like to watch it. Excellent. And from our side, thank you very much to everyone who joined us today, um, particularly everyone who asked questions. Um, and thank you, obviously, um, and especially to Kaz um, for a very, very informative um, session. So thank you very much, Kaz. Thank you very much, Diane.